The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, it was a very big week this week in uh, Kenya, where the National Environmental Tribunal ruled that authorities at the government had failed to do a thorough environmental assessment of the Lamu coal power plant. Now, this is an issue that had been going on for years, and it was a very, very controversial decision to base a power plant on Lamu Island. Uh, this was a 1,050 megawatt coal fire, uh, coal-fired power plant that was in the Lamu region, I'll, I'll say it. Now, the reason why it's coming to us is because the Chinese uh, had plan to finance and build it. And this was a $2 billion uh, Chinese project that was on a critical part of their Belt and Road and really brought up these issues of whether or not China is exporting uh, its dirty energy policies. You know, this is the same type of energy that did a lot of environmental destruction in China. And now a lot of people are concerned that they're going to bring that kind of energy policy to places like Africa. Let me give you a little bit of ba- background on the the story, and then we're going to get to your take on this, Cobus. Uh, so the National Environmental Tribunal ruled that the – I'll give you a bunch of acronyms here, so bear with me here. The National Environmental Management Authority, which is NEMA, issued the Environmental Impact Report uh, or an env- Environmental Impact Assessment License to the AMU Power Company without following the law. And that was the crux of the decision by the tribunal. And the nonprofit group Decolonized took NEMA to court – for not taking into account the adverse effects that the project would have on the environment, specifically farmlands and what it would do to the local fishing industry. The tribunal said that the AMU Power Company must carry out a fresh environmental impact assessment if it wants to proceed with the project. So now the government, AMU and NEMA, all these uh, these acronyms, they've got 30 days to appeal the ruling. But boy, Kobus, this dropped like a thud because we had been waiting for a ruling. We didn't know which way it was going to go. And this was a very important part for a part of uh, Kenyatta's plan uh, to really bring new power supplies to uh, to Kenya. So what was your reaction, Kobus, when you heard the news? Um, yeah, I was generally happy um, because the you know the 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 um, project would have increased Kenya's uh, emissions, carbon emissions, by about seven hundred percent. Um, and Kenya is actually a, a really a, like a world leader on sustainable energy. Like it, it really, it, at the moment, it uses no coal generated uh, power at all, um, and most of its um, of, of its energy is is, um, is hydro electricity. Um, so it's, it's it's quite progressive in terms of how how it generates energy. Also, of of course, this is uh, you know this, the the first Swahili settlement um, you know kind of in the region. It's this beautiful beautiful port and like incredible like world heritage site so you know building a massive kind of polluting power plant there would have been a tragedy what it raises for me though is is a like kind of the bigger projects it fits into which you know i think we'll discuss later on in this in the in the episode but also uh, what the role of the kenyatta government was and why they were pushing this plant to begin with let's not forget that this is the second major setback in just a few months for the kenyatta government with regards to Chinese-funded projects. The third phase of the standard gauge railway that was supposed to take the line to Kisumu uh, also did not go through. So we'll talk about that as well. So we are thrilled now to get some perspective on the Lamu coal decision by the tri- by tribunal by Omar El Mawi, who is a campaign coordinator for the NGO Decolonize, one of the uh, participants in the case. And he's also a national liaison officer for the Save Lamu organization. And he joins us on the line from Kenya. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very, very busy schedule. I'm doing lots of media interviews about the, uh, the decision. Uh, we really appreciate your time, Omar. Yeah, um, it's a good it's a good time uh, to be someone coming from Lamu in Kenya. Um, we've had uh, a mind-boggling um, decision by the National Environmental Tribunal that's showing the importance of the place of communities, 
uh, and the importance of protecting our environment and everything that we hold dear here in Kenya. And therefore, we are happy uh, that at least uh, the court saw sense and decided uh, to cancel the license of this of this plant. Now, this this case is not over. So you have you've won a, a you know you've won this battle, but you have not necessarily won the war. There's still an appeals process that is underway. What is your next step in terms of the, of the legal process with regards to to the case? Um, as far as uh, we're concerned, it's not us who will be making the next steps. As far as the case is concerned, it's it's for the it's for Amu Powers, the project proponent, um, or NIMA as uh, the the organisation that issued uh, the environmental impact assessment license. Uh, but as far as uh, where we are sitting, we see only three options for them that they could exercise. One, they could say they disagree with the decision of the tribunal, um, and they say good luck with that. Um, and then they decide to uh, appeal the decision to a higher court, which we call it here as the Environmental and Land Court. Uh, it's a court that has uh, the same status as a high court in Kenya, uh, which entertains matters of environment and land uh, within within uh, within Kenya. Uh, so they could appeal within 30 days about that decision and get a decision uh, on whether that uh, ruling was fair. Uh, the second option that they have um, is just to decide that they're going to lick their wounds and just just uh, call it uh, closed and just, you know, um, count their losses and decide to just abandon this uh, nonsensical idea altogether. Um, the third thing they could uh, decide uh, that they agree with the decision of the tribunal because the tribunal mentioned uh, that the process that they followed in getting the environmental impact assessment license was flawed in myriad ways, including uh, the fact that they did not uh, conduct adequate public participation and in involving uh, both the community in Lamu and the general public uh, in getting their concerns uh, and issues around the plant. Um, and also they did not uh, even provide adequate information on some of the things that they're handling, including uh, stuff to do with the ash yard um, and, and how uh, the ash that's going to come from the coal plant, how they're going to be dealing with it, where actually it's going to be located. Um, and the fact that even the environmental impact assessment report concedes that that ash yard where it's going to be located is going to be uh, in a flood uh, risk uh, or prone area. Um, and, and therefore, um, if... Uh, they go back, they'll have to redo the whole process, consider uh, every stakeholder within Lamu County and the Kenyan public, uh, include enough adequate information of all these issues, um, and still have to prove uh, both to the National Environmental Management Authority uh, and if challenged to the National Environmental Tribunal that that report uh, provides uh, a good uh, account of how that project is going to be done in a way that is not going to affect uh, the environment, the, 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 the air, uh, the health, uh, economic issues, livelihoods, and also not exacerbate uh, climate change. Um, so referring back to my question at the, at the beginning, um, why, do you, why do you think the Kenyatta government wanted this project to begin with? What is the kind of political will behind it? Yeah, so all this started uh, back in 2013 um, when we had this ambitious um, uh, efforts of trying to do something we call the Vision 2030. Now, under the Vision 2030, uh, we have a series of or a multitude of projects that are proposed, um, and some of them are uh, a big uh, energy-consuming uh, uh, projects. And therefore, the country or, or, or the government decided that they need um, a lot of electricity because of the expected uh, consumption that was coming up. Uh, and therefore, they came up with what they call the least, the, the power uh, master plan uh, or the energy master plan uh, of 2013, uh, which wanted to generate about 5,000 megawatts of electricity in a span of about 40 months. Now, of these 5,000 megawatts, different uh, ways are given, for example, wind and, and solar and other areas, but coal was given about 1,900 megawatts out of 5,000. And therefore, from here, that's when now they started talking about the coal plant um, being situated in Lamu and also. Also, the fact that we started discovering coal in Kenya, uh, on the eastern part of Kenya, a place called Kitui, whereby they discovered uh, good deposits uh, of coal, and they wanted to mine the coal and start using locally. Uh, the funny bit is that uh, even while finding coal here, they still say that the Lamu coal plant is going to import coal from South Africa, uh, whereby 
um, they're saying uh, it's going to be cheaper because you don't have to have the infrastructure to take the call all the way or the 300 kilometer from uh, the eastern part of Kenya, as well as the fact that the call in South Africa is uh, of a better quality than the call that we have uh, internally. Uh, so definitely that's where the call plant came in, um, and that's where now the government invited uh, interested parties uh, to submit tenders uh, to generate uh, the 1,050 megawatts of electricity from coal uh, in a relationship which they call build on and operate whereby a private entity comes in, they build the plant, and then they sell the power to Kenya Power and Lightning Company here uh, in Kenya. Omar, you know, it's very interesting to us. I've, listening, I've been listening to your interviews uh, over the past few days on the BBC and other uh, media networks in response to the tribunal's decision, and you've never mentioned China at all. And it's interesting about the framing of this story, in part because uh, to a lot of outsiders in the international press and the international media, uh, this is very much a China story, but yet to people in the Lamu campaign, it's much more focused on uh, Kenyatta, for example. And let me just give you a headline here from Quartz Africa, Abdi Latif Dahir, who's a you know a great China Africa reporter for Quartz. Uh, he he said China's plan to help build Kenya's first coal plant has been stopped for now. And it's interesting. What I find is interesting is the focus on China. What role do you assign to China in all of this? And, uh, and and why haven't you been talking more about China? Because it seems that other people on the outside looking in see this as very much a, an integral part of China's engagement in Africa. Yeah, and it's interesting because I'm supposed to talk more on that. If I haven't, then I'm going to ensure that I do more and more. Um, but definitely China has a big part to play on this. Um, for starters, um, the financing of the, of the project, uh, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China is coming in with 1.2 billion US dollars of the 2 billion that's required for the plant. Um, they've committed for that. Um, the contractor is coming from China, Power China, uh, and definitely um, the technology is coming from China. Uh, and therefore, China has a big place to, to play. Um, and and uh, in any way, uh, we can see that um, they are also pushing for having this plant because if China uh, today decide that they're not going to invest on this project, then uh, good luck for them getting the financing uh, to be able to do it. Uh, definitely. Yes, but, but let me interrupt you very quickly here, because China will probably say that they respond to the requests of the host government. Yeah. So this is something that's been requested. So the Chinese say, listen, you want a power plant? We'll give you a power plant. If you want something else, we'll give you something else. But it's up to you to decide what you want. So are we holding the Chinese responsible, or is this really the Kenyan government that's ultimately responsible, and China's just financing it and providing the contracting company? No, Chinese, China has to be responsible because, one, China is signatory to the Paris Agreement, whereby they've committed to cut down their uh, carbon emissions, and definitely they've started closing coal plants uh, in hundreds in their country. Um, and definitely if uh, they are following uh, requests by government, they have to ensure that these requests are fair, uh, and requests that are abiding by both local and international laws. Um, and we all know that Kenya has signed to the Paris Agreement, whereby we've committed to cut down our carbon emissions by at least 30% uh, by, by 2030. And therefore, having this plant is going to, uh, in many ways, uh, make us not honor that, 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 uh, that requirement. Uh, definitely, China uh, is also investing a lot on renewables uh, locally with, within their country. And I think uh, they have to be uh, fair uh, and, and, and reasonable because if they've already made the decision that coal is not the way to go anymore and they're closing theirs and having new, new renewable energy, um, and if this is really about uh, a thing about uh, providing financing, I think the Kenyan government would uh, have ha happily agreed to accept the same financing if they, uh, China decided that they're only going to be investing in renewables. Uh, and, and, and definitely uh, the last thing, uh, is is the fact that um, you know government does not necessarily mean the people who are in power. It also means uh, the general population and, and the people of Kenya. Um, and therefore, China doesn't shouldn't be lazy in just making these decisions from what uh, a few executives are telling them. But they should look uh, deeply at the issues, at the communities that are going to be affected, at the general population in Kenya, and figure out uh, what really the people want um, and whether in any way they are helping with this. And finally. Um, the same uh, argument if China were to peddle it. Um, you'll see that China disagreed to issue another loan to the Kenyan government on the extension of the SGR, uh, SGR line from Nairobi to Naivasha. 
Um, but but definitely, if uh, indeed they're saying that they only give money for what government asks, then they should have given it uh, there. Uh, and the reason why they didn't give it is because they they say there's a there's, there's a need of looking at the viability of this project because uh, they are seeing that it's not adding value and it's uh, adding to the uh, to the country's debt, uh, which is uh, not in any way helping the government to develop, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the point that you make, if China did simply declare that they are just not going to be funding any more coal powered fire, you know, coal fired power plants around the world. That would be a significant step towards the climate leadership that China is already trying to claim for itself. Um, you know, currently China is funding about a quarter of all the the, the new coal fired coal fired plants that are being built around the world. Um, you know, I, I I think that that probably you know also then that would be a different China maybe than the one we have currently. But you know, uh, what that's worth um, the. The, the the plant itself, as far as I understand, the proposed plant would also have been f- would have fitted into a wider project called the Lapset project, um, which also you know kind of is, is uh, includes a, a big port being also being currently being built around Lamu. Um, to which extent, like, how close are those two projects, the port project and the power plant? How close are they related? Um, and d- uh, do you um, work on any aspects of the port side of it, which I understand is also causing environmental problems? Uh, thanks. Really good question. Um, so first thing is uh, Lapset, which is Lamu Port, South Sudan Ethiopian Transport Corridor. Uh, definitely is uh, a big project here in Kenya, and it joins about two other countries, that is South Sudan and and Ethiopia, uh, and more recently Uganda as well. Um, And it's a project that brings uh, on board different components, including um, the Lamu port uh, pipelines uh, that are going to bring oil all the way down to Lamu, um, international airports, resort cities, um, SGR, standard gauge railways, among others. And the question about how uh, far they are uh, between the Lamu coal plant and Lapset, uh, it's a distance of about five kilometers, roughly, so to speak. Um, and, and, and therefore, um, one of the arguments that we've had, and uh, we've actually through uh, Save Lamu uh, back in Lamu, they went to court, uh, not necessarily wanting to stop Lapset, uh, but uh, pushing for uh, all relevant stakeholders to be involved in ensuring that Lapset is done in a good way. Uh, the government and the coal proponents have done all they they could uh, in ensuring that they separate Lapset from the coal plant. But from where we stand, we see that the coal plant, um, you know, the, the biggest uh, justification of having the coal plant is that uh, to generate some electricity that are going to be used by the Lapset project. Um, and, and therefore, uh, our biggest argument is... Uh, Definitely to show that, um, you know, while we want uh, to develop, we want to have Lapset and all its components uh, in a way that's sustainable and not in any way affecting the communities. Uh, and after the community going to court on Lapset, actually one of the uh, judgment or one of the things that were considered was the fact that the fishermen are going to be affected by the port. It's going to be a very big port, a 32 bath port. Um, I think it's going to be second only to the port that you have in Durban. Um, and, and therefore, this uh, means that the, the fishermen who are depending on this area to, do their, to, to get their livelihood and to feed and sustain their family won't be able to get uh, to do what they are used or know, only know how to do. Um, and, and therefore, the court uh, declared that there are violations of several rights in how this project was done. Uh, and definitely, they recognized, uh, I think, for the first time, uh, fishermen rights as property rights, you know, the same rights of the same status as owning land uh, and therefore having the right of using this land. Uh, and finally, just to knee between the two, um, Lapset, uh, the coal plant won't make any sense without the Lapset project, uh, but definitely what we are arguing is as much as we want the components of Lapset, there still are better alternatives of having uh, renewable energy at even a cheaper cost uh, than the coal plant uh, and definitely not having to uh, go through all these devastating impacts and effects that are coming from the plant. Well, let's pick up that part of the conversation because this is what's the most interesting. For someone who lives in Asia, as I do, where the, the deal that was made with the people was we'll grow the economy very, very fast. And it's happening in Vietnam and it's happened in China and throughout Asia, but there's going to be an environmental price that is paid. And people get more food in their bellies, they get an economy that's growing, and they become richer. But at the end of the day, the water is not as clean, the air is dirty, uh, there's 
horrific consequences to the development. There's no doubt about it. But I think if you ask a lot of people in Asia, um, would they have done it differently? I think a lot of people probably would say no because of the benefits. So when we talk now about industrialization in Africa, and power is one of the big problems in terms of growing the economy. It's difficult to set up manufacturing facilities. It's difficult to have education uh, institutions if there isn't consistent power supplies. And so if it's not going to be uh, this coal-fired power plant, which you, you've made a very good case and clearly the tribunal agrees with you, then what is going to be needed in order to deliver the kinds of power that Kenya needs? And 1,000 megawatts is a lot of power. Can renewables fill that gap in your view? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, it's not news um, that Kenya is leading uh, in Africa and number eight globally uh, on geothermal generation, which is renewable. And we, our assessment, uh, the last time I checked, we have the capacity of uh, providing between uh, seven to 10,000 megawatts of electricity from, from geothermal. Uh, we have the biggest uh, wind plant in, in Africa, the Electrocana wind, which is providing 310 megawatts of electricity. We have almost, I think, the biggest solar plant in Africa now until the one in Egypt is built, which is providing almost 50 megawatts of electricity. So this is already happening. It's not things that we are citing from outside Kenya. These are things that are happening in Kenya. Currently, if you just uh, do some brief research, you will see that in the month of, of February, our, our generation capacity or what was uh, feed in, into, the, into the grid, 87% came, came from renewables. And therefore, this is something that is happening. Um, and, and definitely, I know the argument uh, that we are having from, from the coal proponents and from some sectors of, of the government is the fact that we need uh, coal for, for base load, to, for industrialization, all these other things. And our argument is that now uh, geothermal can provide uh, base load. And definitely, we've made uh, quite uh, big steps uh, in storing technologies as far as uh, energy is concerned. And therefore, we can actually be able to store uh, all this energy that we generate in excess uh, between wind and solar. Uh, and finally, the fact that, you know, there's a reason why we have all these coal plants. If you look everywhere in the world, you'll see that they're going to communities that are very poor, communities who cannot speak for themselves, communities who have no one to speak for, and communities who don't even know their rights. And they are told that we are having this plant because it's going to generate uh, employment. In our case here in, La in Lamu, the coal plant was going to generate about 2,000 uh, employment opportunities during the construction phase, which is a period of about 32 months, um, and also going to employ about 400 people during the uh, operation phase. And if you just, you know, just look at the figures a little bit more closely, you'll see that um, at the construction phase, we don't have any expertise here uh, of people who can do some technical uh, work around the issues. And therefore, we've seen uh, media reports uh, is stating that the contractor, which, who is Chinese, is going to employ almost more than 1,000 people to come and construct this plant from China. Uh, if you look at the employment phase, of course, you know, the majority of the people in Lamu, uh, no, uh, the literacy level, illiteracy levels are quite high, um, and therefore they don't have the technical know-how uh, of running a coal plant. So while we are generating about 400 uh, employment opportunities for people not from Lamu, and definitely being the first coal plant in Kenya and East Africa, also not uh, within the region, um, we are actually affecting uh, an, an economy that about 75% um, of it depends either directly or indirectly on fishing. And if you affect that industry, uh, you affect the tourism industry, because I don't know uh, any tourist who will want to come to a place that is polluted, that has a coal plant, um, then is this really helping the community to be rich or to even, uh, you know, um, ensuring that they keep wallowing in poverty um, and, 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 uh, and, and uh, a lot of troubles from the end? If you look at this case now, you know, kind of you, there was this, this major victory now, and now they have the 30 days to appeal. Um, and, and you, at the beginning of, of our conversation, you laid out the, the, the different options that they have. Which one of those options do you think would you bet would, would they actually follow? Um, I would, because I will be giving them legal advice that they're not paying for. <laughs> <laughs> Don't help your enemy, Kobus. That's, uh, you know... <laughs> Yeah, that's correct. But I think I think the tribunal judgment was really, really, really good. Um, it's been a while since I've read something as good as that. Um, as much as they did, they narrowed uh, their jurisdiction and tried to ensure they just concentrate on the process of uh, licensing and, and uh, authorizing uh, a project in progressing. Um, I think um, Amupawa and everyone who's concerned on this phase will have a hard time 
uh, to to appeal that decision. Uh, but definitely, they are they are more than uh, than 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 free to do that. Um, and I would say good luck to them. Um, I know it's not going to generate anything good out of it. Um, I would say the best thing that they should do is just to, you know, close down this thing. They haven't really lost a lot of money. Uh, just close for this lobby uh, for a different project, maybe a wind plant, maybe a solar plant. And the sun shines more than almost 300 days here uh, in Kenya. Uh, and they could make a killing as well from this. Um, and, and therefore, I would say if they continue persisting on this route, um, definitely while they have a lot of money, while they have the numbers, they have uh, all of the people who are supposed to be convinced on their side, uh, for us, you know, we, we, we are really fighting for survival. We are fighting for existence. We are fighting for our people. There's no other place we will go, and therefore we'll keep doing this uh, until, uh, you know, uh, heaven, heaven comes. Well, you, you know, we have a lot of folks in Washington and a lot of folks in Beijing who listen to the show. So I like the idea that you are putting out a call here that this is an opportunity for the Americans to stick it to the Chinese by building a big solar plant in Lamu. And at the same time, this is an opportunity for the Chinese to stick it to the Americans by build, bringing all of their renewable technology <laughs> that they're so good at to Lamu as well. So let's see who can outdo each other in the renewable <laughs> sector and not in loaning billions of dollars for dirty coal projects. So Definitely. I, I could agree with you more. Um, and I think the fact that China has to realize that the reputation is at stake. This is a project that has been ruled to have uh, disregarded the law in how the process was done. Um, and therefore, if China keeps uh, wanting to be uh, you know, affiliated to this project, it just shows that they don't really regard, they disregard uh, the court process, they disregard how the laws are supposed to be done. And even if they go back and they do this process well now, I mean, these are people who you cannot really trust to ensure that they're going to do this project in a way that's going to be sustainable. Um, and therefore, it's something that they should uh, get out of uh, as soon as possible before it becomes even worse for them uh, and their name is, uh, you know, tarnished uh, for, for a while. Well, even this is an opportunity for them to actually re-engage you and start over again. Yeah. That's so let's kind of, you know, the, I mean, if ICBC sat down with you, Omar, and said, okay, coal didn't work, we're going to respect the, you know, China does a lot of talking about, you know, not interfering in the internal affairs of other countries and not kind of meddling. That's That's their big platform. So if they kind of came to you and said, let's sit down and talk about how we can make this into a renewable project, not only would that be beneficial for the people of Lamu in eastern Kenya, but at the same time would also help their reputation as well. That might be giving them far too much credit for being too enlightened, so I'm not sure they'll actually do that. But boy, as a communicator and a PR guy, that would be the smart move to play. Hey, Omar, listen, I know you're super busy. Thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations again on a hard-fought one, well-deserved. Uh, listen, if people want to follow your side of the campaign and what you guys have been doing and what Decolonize is doing, what's the best way for them to stay in touch with you? Uh, definitely several ways. Um, our website um, is uh, Decolonize. Uh, call is uh, call itself, the dirty fuel is fossil fuel energy. Uh, decolonize uh, with a Z, a Z. Uh, dot org o r g uh, that's d e c o a l i uh, sorry uh, l o n i z e uh, dot o r g uh, definitely you can follow us on all our social media platforms we're available on facebook at decolonize uh, kenya we are also available on twitter uh, at decolonize uh, and definitely you can follow me on my personal account as well at justice underscore el Maui. Well, we'll put links to all of that. Omar Elmawi is a campaign coordinator for the NGO Decolonize and also a national liaison officer for the Save Lamu organization and one of the, uh, the, the you know, a winning side of this uh, very important tribunal decision that came out of Kenya regarding the Lamu coal power plant. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, John. And I just needed to clarify, um, I'm no longer working with Save Lamu, but I support them in everything that I do. So I just remain as the coordinator of uh, Decolonize. Fantastic. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Kobus, the most interesting part of the discussion for me was this idea that if the Chinese continue to go down this path on the Lamu Island coal-fired power plant, they are going to severely hurt their international reputation. And at the same time, I see a huge opportunity for the Chinese here, and in part because so much of China's foreign policy today is framed within the broader U.S.-China tensions that are out there, that Trump is really pushing hard for coal. Uh, the U.S. is, is you know, making it easier for, for the coal industry. Uh, we're expanding coal in the United States and usage of coal. 
And again, it's it's an opportunity for the, the Chinese to position themselves very, very starkly against the Americans and saying, we're not for coal anymore. We're not exporting our dirty hydrocarbon uh, technology to other countries. And in fact, we're going to celebrate the fact that China is a leader in renewable technology now. So it just, it, you know, the optics of it seem like this is a great opportunity to sit down and say, okay, we respect the findings of the tribunal. Let's start over again to help solve your energy problems, but this time let's do it in a clean way. And again, as I mentioned in, the, in, in our discussion, it's, there's a two-pronged win here. Number one is you're helping the people of Lamu, and the number, number two is you're sticking it to the Americans. <laughs> and that's a big priority for the Chinese, is to show that they are engaged in sustainable development in places like Africa, which in many ways they are. But in this case, this dominates so much of the headlines in the discussion that it takes away from the other accomplishments that the Chinese have done in Africa on this uh, on, on environmental issues and sustainability development. I couldn't agree more. This is a golden opportunity for them, um, and you know, they and the they have a window at the moment where they can kind of simply step in and claim that leadership position. But that window is not going to be open forever. Like um, Emmanuel Macron announced in the run up to the G20 summit this year that that. France France is taking a very hard line on climate change and that they will refuse to sign a, a, J, a joint G20 agreement, a leadership leaders agreement, or what I mean is a, a, a joint G20 leaders declaration if there is a, if the G20 doesn't deal with climate change in some kind of significant way. So France is already gunning for that, like we're, we're leading on the environment position in the world. And I think to a certain extent, um, China has a, has a stronger case to make, you know, because China has been a world leader on the, on the implementation of renewables for a while. Um, so there's definitely, you know, the, that position is up for grabs at the moment. And, and I think it's really important to actually for whoever does it, you know, to, to really take that kind of hard line. Let me ask you a question, because this is the third setback on Chinese-funded projects in East Africa over the past few months, and I want to see if there are dots that can be connected. Uh, we talked about earlier about the SGR line to Navasha uh, that uh, that Raila Odinga and also Kenyatta went to Beijing to the Belt and Road Forum and tried to get funding, could not secure the funding for the second time. Uh, the Chinese said that, and this is what I heard uh, in the back channels, was that the Kenyans wanted to move this from a market-based loan to a concessional loan, and the Chinese didn't want to do it. Talks fell down. It broke apart. Then we have the $10 billion uh, deal for the Bagamayo port in Tanzania that fell apart, uh, and, the, and the Tanzanians said it wasn't a good deal for them. And finally, now the Lamu coal-fired power plant for $1.2 billion of ICBC funding. Is there any connection between these, or is that are these just disparate events that have actually happened just in the same time? I mean, can we draw any lessons from this at this in the past few months? Um, I think you think that it's kind of both at the same time. On the one hand, they, you, these are separate projects, and they're all, you know, they, they, um, I'm sure that the kind of economic calculus behind the different decisions all were made on kind of project-to-project -project, uh, basis. However, they all are regionally connected, and regional connection is, is what the BRI is about. So they all come to seem like BRI projects falling down. Um, and I think that is, so that, that narrative kind of lives whether, whether there are formal links between the projects or not. Um, you know, so, so in that sense, I think it raises a lot of questions about the BRI as a whole, you know, about, uh, about BRI decisions, about the sustainability of the projects, about how those decisions are made. Um, you know, and, and then about how the financing is going to work around them. Yeah, and the same time, I mean, that's a more negative way of looking at it, but a more positive way of looking at it might be that both sides in these relationships now are starting to assert themselves to maximize their own interests. And that's actually a healthy thing. The fact that the Tanzanians pushed back on the Bagamayo port and said, this isn't a good deal for us, and the Chinese backed down, that's good. The fact that the Chinese did not give in to Kenyatta and Odinga's request to switch to a concessional loan when the viability of the project may not have been worthwhile, that's a good thing for Chinese taxpayers. And at the same time, the fact that the tribunal acted in, in what they thought, and obviously what they decided was Lamu's best interest and Kenya's best interest, is an assertion of agency. And so in some ways, this is maybe a maturing of the relationship that projects are going to have to fight and really be worthwhile rather than the free-for-all that we've had for the past 10 years. 
Yeah, and of course that then you know fits into uh, the wider Chinese government line that they're not funding vanity projects anymore, and that everything has to be sustainable. So you know, you know that 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 is the over overarching kind of narrative that the Chinese are trying to put out about the BRI as a whole. So it it shows that that a that the BRI is this kind of evolving project that that keeps resetting itself, but then also that them that it it you know that there might be a way of seeing it as um, as 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 a more a less kind of wild westy kind of project project than it looked like before you know kind of that there might be some form of like unified oversight um over over some of these projects i mean we'll have to see uh how how it shakes out and it'll be very interesting to then compare them to things like for example the renegotiation of deal bri deals um in in malaysia um and how whether those same kind of trends are running across in in other bri zones as well well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next 30 days, whether the government and AMU come back to file an appeal or if the Chinese themselves re-engage. And boy, if anybody in Beijing is listening, go look up Omar and call him <laughs> because these are smart guys and you can come up with something actually very, very compelling if you actually work with the civil society groups. And this is one of the areas where China's also been weak is working with groups like Decolonize. Now, I know that this, they're not very good at and not willing to work with NGOs. There's a lot of suspicion in China of working with non-governmental organizations. But this is a case where a guy like Omar knows not only what the country needs, but at the same time, what's feasible. And feasibility is the word of the day in Beijing at the policy banks. And so when he was talking about how we can use sustainable technologies to fill the energy gap really smashes the coal industry's narrative that says we have to go through a dirty phase of power development in order to get to the renewable energy fit technologies. That is, the, that is what everybody says. You got to go through coal first before you can get to solar. And what Omar is saying is that's not true. And Kenya is actually proving that today. So that's a really interesting story. Uh, we're going to continue to follow this over the next 30 days. We'll bring you updates on our website. We'll also keep, a, keep you up to date on our various Twitter feeds and social media. Uh, we'll stay in touch with Omar for you. Of course, we're going to put all of Omar's contact information and decolonize his contact information uh, on, on our site. We'll also give you the government perspective because... Today in our discussion, we only gave you one side, and I'd love to try and find somebody from the industry or from the government perspective to balance out this point of view, because it is a very, very complicated uh, process and project and issue that to deal with. And so we want to try to bring you all of the different sides of this story. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staten, I'm Eric Olander. We'll be back again next week with another edition of the show. Thanks so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. Mm-hmm.